everyone, welcome. My name is Kira Gray. I'm the social work consultant here at the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers. And today I have the pleasure of presenting, of uh, moderating today's presentation titled Defending Children's Rights in New Brunswick is Everyone's Responsibility with Christian Wayland as the presenter. So this presentation is a collaboration between the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers, the Canadian Association of Social Workers, and the New Brunswick Champions for Child Rights. This is gonna be the first of a three-part webinar series that's focused on child rights, rights that we're so happy to be hosting. Uh, before introducing Christian, I'll just quickly go over some housekeeping items. So today's presentation is going to be approximately 45 minutes long, followed by a 15-minute question and answer period. I encourage you to type in your questions at any time and I'll begin asking them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is also going to be recorded and will be made available tomorrow on CASW's website under the Continuing Education tab. And the slides are available for download through the resource widget located at the left of your screen. Uh, finally, a certificate of attendance will be available at the end of the presentation. Simply click the yellow rainmost icon at the bottom of the window when the presentation is wrapping up. All of this information and more can be found under the welcome widget that popped up when you first logged on. And with all that being said, it's my honor to introduce our speaker, Christian Whalen. Christian is a native of Fredericton and holds degrees from Carleton University, the University of New Brunswick, and from the Université de Strasbourg as a French government scholar and Council of Europe Human Rights Fellow. He is currently the Deputy Advocate in the Office of the Child and Youth Advocate here in New Brunswick, and he has been responsible for systemic investigations and acted as lead investigator on several reports of ombudsman and of the child and youth advocate. So we're so happy to have you here with us today. And without further ado, I'm going to step out of the frame and hand it over to you, Christian. Thank you, Kira. Um, well, for, for my part, uh, I'm just very uh, pleased to have the opportunity to start off this webinar series. and. Uh, uh, very much uh, indebted to the NBASW and uh, the CASW and to Kira in particular. I had a text this morning from Kira saying, uh, you know, is this, uh, uh, you know, still on? Should I come down to the uh, to the office or should we do this uh, by conference call uh, given the storm? We're in the middle of the winter storm here in Fredericton of epic proportions. I mean, in the middle of the storm, these are still like whiteout conditions. So uh, it was great uh, to get down here and find uh, everything coming with activity and everything set to go for the webinar. Um, our, uh, so I'll, I'll just work through the, uh, the slide deck here. And uh, the Champions is uh, very excited uh, to be presenting this uh, first webinar in a series, uh, like Kira mentioned. Um, Champions uh, for Child's Rights is an organization in New Brunswick that is uh, uh, six years old now, but uh, still uh, wanting to encourage people to join as individuals or as organizations. It's basically a forum uh, for anyone in the province that is invested in service delivery to children and young people, whether in the private sector, public sector, uh, non-profit sector, uh, very much made up of agencies and non-profits uh, who deliver services to children and youth day in, day out, and who want to get together uh, to learn more about children's rights and to better defend uh, the rights of the child uh, throughout New Brunswick and Canada. So uh, this is the first time we have uh, a webinar series uh, proposed, and. Uh, we have uh, today's uh, presentation, uh, as a general primer on children's rights and an update on how kids in Canada are doing uh, today. Um, and in March, on March 11th, that will be followed up uh, by a presentation by Dr. Sarah Gander uh, on social pediatrics. I'll be talking a little bit about social pediatrics today. And um, in May, uh, Brandy Hatfield and Julie Gallant Daigle uh, will have uh, a webinar on child poverty and youth homelessness. And so uh, we encourage you to uh, connect for those events. Um, so today I'll talk 
a very briefly sort of general overview about children's rights, what they are. I'd really like to spend a little bit more time, I only have a few slides there, but I'd like to take some time looking at Canada's fifth and sixth report uh, to the UN. That just came out uh, the week before last. And uh, it's uh, so it's breaking news and it's something that uh, Canadians should be talking about. Uh, um, it's, you know, hasn't really made the news cycle. Um, but it is something we should be paying attention to. This is uh, an important step in how we report to the world on how Canada is doing in terms of our obligations to children. And uh, I'll, I'll follow that up with a few slides that talk about actually what is the situation of childhood in Canada and, uh, and then how can we better address our responsibilities to children as professionals and sort of linking back to the theme of making children's rights implementation everyone's business. Um, so some of our learning objectives uh, today are to better understand children's rights uh, to gain a sense of how kids in Canada are faring, uh, to learn about collaborative and interdisciplinary approaches uh, in implementing children's rights, and what we can each do in our various professional lives uh, to move the matter forward. Uh, so briefly, um, just to situate children's rights in the, in the whole framework of human rights implementation globally, um, people know that uh, this, this, this whole project uh, of um, uh, human rights implementation goes back to the end of the Second World War. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, ushered in what was called the, with the Peace Treaty in San Francisco in 45, a new world order, a world that was committed to peace and uh, the maintenance of harmonious relations among all peoples of the earth and uh, through tolerance and mutual respect and understanding. And so we have a framework for that, and it's a human rights framework. Constitutions all around the world uh, are premised on uh, these foundational principles of law. And um, so we start with the UDHR in 48 and 66 through a covenants on civil and political rights and a covenant on social and economic rights. And then through the march of time, there was the fight for racial equality. In the 70s, there was the, the push for women's equality and, uh, and, and the rights of disabled persons. And uh, it was only in 1989 um, that the world decided to give itself an international legal treaty, a binding international legal treaty on the rights of the child. There was a declaration from 1959, um, but it's been 30 years now that we have a convention on the rights of the child. And this convention is actually the most universally ratified human rights instrument in the world. All the other instruments are fairly broadly uh, ratified and they're part of customary international law in many instances because so many countries have adhered uh, to those principles. Um, but every nation on earth has uh, ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, except one, and of course that is uh, Donald Trump's America. Um, how uh, do we implement this treaty? Um, uh, within the UN system, the, the folks responsible for the convention are the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, so there is a treaty body within the UN General Secretariat under the auspices of the UN High Commission uh, for Human Rights. And of course, that uh, commission is uh, reports to the General Assembly uh, and to the Security Council, but it is supported by UN programs and funds and agencies. So WHO, UNESCO, UNICEF, uh, these are all institutions of the United Nations that support uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in its task of monitoring child's rights implementation. Um, so the convention has about 40 substantive rights provisions. Uh, the committee groups them into eight clusters. Uh, so if you really want to kind of boil uh, children's rights down to its essentials, uh, you know that there are some provisions that are there to talk about general measures of implementation, Article 4, 42, 44, 
what the governments have to do to uh, maintain and observe uh, children's rights to make them known. Um, there's a grouping of provisions with respect to the definition of the child. Uh, the convention applies to every person on earth under uh, 18 years of age. Um, and it uh, has four general principles that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the rest of the groupings of rights uh, are civil rights and freedoms, so uh, your fundamental liberties that are protected in our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, but also, uh, in the case of children, their right to privacy and their right to information. Um, uh, these are all civil and political rights under the Convention. There's a whole series of rights for children that don't exist in our Canadian Charter or in the uh, UN covenants on civil and political rights. This is part of the way in which the, the Convention really adapted the human rights framework to the lived reality of, of children. So uh, children have a right to registration at birth and a right to a name and an identity, the right to know their parents the right to be cared for by their parents, um, the right not to be separated from their parents unless it's absolutely necessary in their best interest um, and, uh, and following judicial due process. Um, they have a right uh, to adoption and a right to be protected from all forms of harm. Um, and so all of these rights um, are part of a cluster of family environment and alternative care. Um, if they are placed in care, children also have a right to uh, regular uh, uh, review of their conditions of placement. Um, so these are rights that are uh, very central in children's lives, and they don't exist in any other human rights instrument, but they are fundamentally important human rights of children. Um, the convention is also interesting in that, in terms of health, uh, it is the first human rights instrument in the world to proclaim the rights of disabled persons. Of course, uh, 20 years after uh, the convention, or 15 years after, 17 years after the convention was adopted, uh, there was a global convention on the rights of disabled persons. Um, but it was uh, the UNCRC, which was the first international human rights instruments that talked about the rights of disabled children and uh, the right to special measures of protection uh, to give them a full and decent life in community. Uh, and so that Article 23 right couples with Article 24, which defines every child's right to the maximum attainable standard uh, of health. And uh, so it's a very uh, onerous uh, responsibility. It sets a high standard. And uh, like most of these rights, these rights of the children are aspirational. Um, there are a cluster of rights around education, leisure, and cultural activities, and a cluster of rights around special protection measures. Um, so that is the convention in a nutshell, along with the four guiding core principles uh, non-discrimination, best interest of the child, child's right to life, survival and development, and respect for the views of the child. The child has a right to be listened to anytime there's a decision impacting a child administratively or in a judicial forum. Um, the, ch the child's views should be heard and taken into consideration. And so these four guiding principles, they apply in every situation where children's rights are being determined. And so we always have to come back to, even if we're dealing with a, uh, a right to protection, and, uh, a, a right against drug endangerment or a right to privacy, um, we have to look at the implementation, the exercise and the analysis of that right in light of these four guiding um, principles under Articles 2, 3, 6 and 12. Um, Beyond that, um, people interested in children's rights should know in the committee uh, when governments are reporting to the committee on how well are we doing, 
the committee is looking for certain things. When we talk about general measures of implementation under Articles 4, 42, 44, um, there's a list, actually, of what does the UN expect governments to be doing to make these rights a lived reality for children. So if you've ratified the convention, then you need a national plan of action. You need coordinating mechanisms. You need, in a federal state like Canada, you need coordinating mechanisms at every level of government for horizontal coordination between ministries and agencies, but you need coordinating mechanisms between levels of government um, for children's rights. And uh, you have to be able to demonstrate a program of law reform and judicial enforcement of these rights. How are these rights actually uh, made real and enforceable in your country uh, before the courts of the land? And how has the convention and, and children's rights been translated into legislation in your country? Um, the committee is also uh, recommending that governments engage in child rights impact assessment. So anytime we develop new laws, new regulations, new major policy decisions, that we're filtering those decisions by looking at what's the impact of this proposal for children and how will it impact uh, the optimization of their rights negatively or positively. If there are negative measures, how are we going to diminish those negative impacts on children's rights. Um, there should be awareness raising. So events like today, um, how are we educating ourselves about the rights of the child? Uh, how are we training professionals who deal with children and young people every day to be knowledgeable about children's rights? Uh, how do we train children themselves uh, in order to advocate for themselves and to respect the rights of their peers? Um, uh, governments, when they make the report, should be clear about how much they're spending on children and making children visible in budgets, as UNICEF says. Um, they should be doing good monitoring and data collection with respect to the lives of children. Uh, they should have a statutory child's rights institution, a child and youth advocate's office, like the one where I work, uh, or nationally, uh, a children's commissioner or children's ombudsman, such as we don't have in Canada, despite recommendations from the Committee to Canada over the last three reporting periods. Um, there should be participation of civil society. This is not this is not a challenge uh, for government alone. Uh, government has the brunt of uh, the obligations in terms of making children's rights a uh, lived reality. Um, it's something that it has to do with the business sector, with civil society. And so we do all have to step up. We have to do that in the spirit of international cooperation, um, especially uh, having a view to the needs of children in the world's poorest countries. Um, and uh, we need to make sure that we are keeping up with um, ratifications of child's rights instruments. For instance, in Canada, uh, we still haven't ratified the third optional protocol, which gives children around the world the right to make a complaint directly themselves to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Why hasn't Canada done that? Um, there are, in the reporting cycle, and this is the process that Canada is in right now, and the reporting cycle is, is, is changing. The Committee on the Rights of the Child is trying to streamline the process, um, but basically, you know, how we make sure that we're taking children's rights seriously, it is through this process of every five years reporting to the committee and saying, we have a plan, we're working the plan, uh, we're making progress, here's where we've slipped back, this is, you know, how much we're spending, this is how we're accountable. And then we have recommendations that come uh, back to the country. So uh, there's a submission of the state party report, um, that's the stage that has just happened this year. Canada has reported on the last six or seven years of effort since 2012 when we last reported. And uh, now uh, the committee has that report and it's been shared with Canadian civil society. So Canada uh, and people all around the table on, on this call should be looking at Canada's report and it's available online. Uh, you just have to search for it or or go to the website of the Canadian Coalition on the Rights of the Child, and you can download copies of uh, Canada's report. 
uh, and the annex is. And so it's for us now to comment on it because there's a process of shadow reports and civil society organizations play a very important role when Canada will appear next fall or possibly early next winter. Um, the representatives of the government of Canada will go to Geneva uh, to present uh, their report and to hear uh, the questions from committee members. And, uh, and, and at that time, there will be a dialogue with representatives of Canadian civil society and we hope of Canadian children and young people themselves uh, who may have things to say about you know, whether or not their rights are being respected. And uh, so after that process, we'll receive a new set of concluding uh, observations from the committee and we'll be able to, you know, recommit ourselves to following up on those concluding observations and to, uh, and to you know, take the advice from the world body and improve our efforts at protecting children's rights. We haven't done a great job of actually listening to what the UN has been saying the last two times. Um, but hope springs eternal. Uh, these are serious commitments. So what does Canada's report actually say? I, I want to highlight here some um, strengths and, and what I see at least as some of the weaknesses in, uh, in Canada's last report. On the positive side, uh, it was interesting that um, uh, there are a number of annexes to Canada's report, and there's a new reporting structure, and Canada had to comply with, you know, uh, a much tighter page count, and they had to reduce the size of the report. And they were told that our, our previous reports read like a, um, you know, a, a stitched version of 13 reports rather than one national plan. And, and that's because in the past, we always reported, you know, what is the federal government doing? And then jurisdiction by jurisdiction, what are all the provinces and territories doing uh, in a federal state like Canada to make children's rights uh, a lived reality? Um, the problem that the UN had with that is that it, it actually didn't show any kind of coordination of effort or um, national plan to improve children's rights across the land. And, and, and so they, this is what they want in a state party report. They want governments to work together and to be accountable uh, and to have a national plan. Um, so uh, in, in this report, uh, we have, um, uh, at least in the annexes, uh, we have an annex on um, data. And so it's the first time that the government has taken out all the data bits that it used to put in its, you know, longer narrative report, and it's put them all into an annex, and that helped them keep their page count down and yet give all um, the data monitoring that the committee likes to see. Well, I think that's exciting because uh, it's the first time that we have a kind of national snapshot of this kind that shows how Canadian children are faring right across the land. And in, in New Brunswick for 10 years, we've been producing a child's rights indicator framework. Um, and it's nice to have a national data set that, uh, that we can compare our work product to. Um, and it makes uh, uh, a first attempt at you know, what would a national uh, child's rights data monitoring framework for Canada look like? Um, the report is also interesting in that they included an annex uh, that summed up uh, children's voices with respect to how do Canadian children feel about the exercise of their rights. And this was done in consultation uh, with many children coast to coast to coast, and it was uh, coordinated by the Canadian Student Commission. Um, and so we have that Canada We Want report which is uh, uh, a good step forward in child participation. And it's a good model for other countries to follow. Um, so uh, th those are some, uh, some of the positives. Um, we also see um, the consultation with civil society um, uh, being carried out by government. So there was an honest effort in, in that direction. But I think we're still uh, we're still in that stage of not working together. 
of having federal, provincial, government institutions saying, we have the reporting obligation, we need to make these reports, um, we're ready to listen, but at the end of the day, it's going to be our report, it'll say what we wanted to say. And uh, so, uh, at the same time, there is this indication uh, from a, a, a meeting of Canadian Ministers for Human Rights last December, uh, or December 20, 2017 actually, that uh, gave a commitment uh, to a new human rights program, a new human rights agenda for Canada. So this is exciting because it, it, it does seem, you know, that we have a government that is uh, showing that it cares about human rights and that they want to do due diligence on human rights issues. And so they've created, it was the first time in 29 years that the ministers for human rights in Canada actually ever met. And they've created a new table of senior officials uh, at the director ADM level. Um, and, and they've opened up the process of the continuing committee of officials on human rights uh, to joint management uh, with provincial and territorial. So there's a provincial territorial co-chair of OCHR for the first time, and we're pleased to see that New Brunswick is uh, in that co-chairing role. Um, the report also had uh, pointed out some very important child's rights developments over the last five or six years, including the adoption of the Vancouver Principles uh, and Joint Doctrine Note uh, in relation to uh, child soldiers, so implementation of Article 38 of the Convention, um, of course, there was uh, a reference uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, drawing due attention to the efforts by the federal government and provincial territorial governments to um, uh, really double down on our efforts to combat child poverty, uh, for instance, through the federal child tax benefit, but also at the provincial territorial level through uh, new improvements in, uh, in in child welfare and uh, early education, especially, um, and and reference to you know lots of good practices, especially in the area of wraparound models of care for child service provision. Uh, uh, integrated service delivery in New Brunswick was certainly flagged in the report and uh, it stands out as a as a Canadian best practice. Um, so it, it's good to flag some of these things, but overall, the report still uh, appeared very disjointed. It, it looked as though it was a little bit disconnected from uh, the field. So I was at a meeting last week of the uh, Child's Rights Academic Network, and there were uh, I was on a call uh, recently in the Canadian Bar Association's uh, uh, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, subcommittee. And so there's a lot of kind of consternation amongst officials with respect to uh, Canada's fifth and sixth reports. We thought this was the opportunity to turn the page, to really make a new start in showing due diligence in terms of children's rights. And that, unfortunately, is not the report that we have. Um, this report had been promised uh, last September uh, but the government was late again uh, with its own internal deadlines, which, again, that makes it difficult to have good dialogue with civil society when we say, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to release this report, and civil society organizes itself around the release of that report. They, uh, the Canadian Coalition of the Rights of the Child had planned an event last November uh, to discuss Canada's report, and there were many, many stakeholders uh, that confirmed their participation. Um, and it was a great event, except there was no federal report to discuss. Um, the report came out three months after the event. Um, so in, in the end, uh, we have a new format of, uh, of reporting, um, but, you know, uh, it doesn't reach the mark in terms of what the committee was looking for in terms of a national plan of action and uh, demonstrated coherence of coordination of effort between federal, provincial, territorial governments. It just looks, again, like a litany of, you know, here are some great things Quebec is doing, here's, you know, what Saskatchewan is doing, uh, a lot of pats on the back all around for everyone, uh, but no 
uh, no strategy, no, no coordination of effort. Um, and in fact, some of the pats on the back are for, um, you know, things that, you know, may have happened uh, before this reporting cycle. So uh, again, you know, family group conferences was pointed out as, a, a, you know, an ongoing great success in New Brunswick. Well, that's old news. You know, that's all stuff that could and should have been said in Canada's 2012 report. Uh, and uh, really innovative and emerging um, uh, things like uh, the new investments in, uh, in child care, uh, which were started under the Gallant government, but confirmed again uh, by Minister Cardi and the Higgs government, um, they're not even referenced. And uh, so it, it, it shows that, you know, there's a little bit of a missed opportunity uh, in this report for Canada to really showcase uh, some of our successes. Um, this, um, this report does not allow for easy reference or any follow-up on the past concluding observations. It starts with a statement that, you know, we are responding to the recommendations and concluding observations from uh, Canada's previous, uh, or the UN committee's previous recommendations. But it actually doesn't go there. Um, we, uh, uh, we have, you know, uh, no new news on the ratification third optional protocol, no new news on the need for a children's commissioner for Canada, no uh, new plan for incorporation of the convention and recognition of children's rights in Canadian domestic law. These are all things that the committee has been saying to Canada forever. And there's no way, I mean, they're just not mentioned in the report. So there's a, there's a lack of accountability and a lack of transparency in our dialogue with the UN treaty body. And that's not a good example for Canada to set. We should, uh, we should own up to our obligations and we should be more transparent of where are we hitting the mark, where are we missing the mark, and if we are missing the mark, why? Um, there's, uh, you know, great effort to listen to what Canadian children are saying uh, and we have that annex, but there's no effort whatsoever to reflect the feedback of Canadian children in Canada's report. You just put it in an annex, and it. But you know how, you know how does that show that we're living Article 12 of the Convention and that uh, we're listening to children? Yes, uh, but are we taking into consideration their views? Um, so I think, again, like if we're going to make efforts towards child participation, they have to be genuine efforts. Um, we, uh, we, again, don't see in this format any kind of real sustained dialogue with civil society um, and uh, uh, no comprehensive plan uh, to address, you know, all the aspects of child's rights implementation. So. Um, you know, the, the main problem is that Canada doesn't have a national plan for children's rights. And so it's very difficult to make a report to the UN without a national plan, because uh, what are we reporting on if, uh, you know, instead what, what happens is, oh, we have to say something, you know, we're going to be caught and uh, it's going to look bad. So what can we say to make things look good? And, and, and so we're just investing in, in face saving. And that's not good enough for children. That's not good for a robust, mature democracy like Canada that takes human rights seriously. But substantively, this report, uh, you know, uh, fails to um, make progress on, on, on some of those, those key issues, like the National Children's Commissioner, optional uh, protocol number three. Those are things that we should have done, uh, you know, years ago. And, uh, and, and, and we need to explain why we're failing to do so. We need to explain why are we still holding out on our reservation under Article 37C. Um, reservations are things that governments put uh, when they ratify a, uh, a human rights treaty globally, but they're expected over time to lift those reservations. So we've had this reservation for 30 years now and, and there's no credible justification uh, for it. Um, no uh, credible response in terms of 
the failure to address the recommendations for the repeal of Section 43 of our criminal code and to join, you know, the uh, the, the global campaign to end uh, all forms of, uh, of uh, punishment of children, corporal punishment of children. There is an overuse of the references to the universal periodic review and I think also a conflation of children's rights and women's equality agenda. So if you look at the report, um, you know, Canada's done many great things in terms of, you know, following up on its commitment to uh, to support families of victims of murdered uh, Indigenous women and girls, and, uh, and 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 we are, you know, doing great things at the federal level in terms of gender-based analysis and and GBA plus. Um, but you know, when it comes to defending children's rights, uh, I would argue feminism is not enough, and you can't conflate the issues of you know being. Uh, being a human rights defender uh, on the challenges of women's equality and not provide the same due diligence to children or persons with disability. Um, you know, the, I, I don't think Canadian women would, would like to see, you know, a disability plus lens for equality issues uh, at the federal government uh, level across the board. And each one of these challenges and each one of these human rights instruments requires its own due diligence. There is a process for accountability in lawmaking for children, and it's not called GBA+. It's called Child's Rights Impact Assessment, and that's where we have to get to. We've been doing it in New Brunswick uh, for seven years. Uh, we need to recommit to that process to make sure that it's a thorough and, uh, and, and authentic uh, child's right impact assessment process, um, but other governments in Canada should be doing the same. Um, there's no word in Canada's report uh, last week on uh, a national strategy or plan of action for child's rights in Canada. The last one we have dates from 2002, a Canada fit for children. Uh, again, like I said, we can't make progress without a plan. And, uh, and of course, uh, we need better systems for coordination of effort across all levels of government. The federal government seems to be moving in that direction, um, but, you know, we would like to see much more action, much more quickly. Um, so there are good models for uh, national reporting in federal states to the UN. And if you want to see a good example of what a federal uh, government report on children's rights to the UN should look like, look at the fifth and sixth reports from Belgium. Um, you'll see there a real authentic dialogue. Um, you'll see all of Belgian society, civil society, uh, government, private sector, academia, working together around plans uh, to take to heart the recommendation and the concluding observations from Geneva and to either say what they have done in response uh, or what they're planning to do uh, to improve the lives of Belgian children. And if Belgium can do it, then surely uh, Canada can do it as well. Let's, let's get on with this agenda. If we do, we will see our economy improve and we will see uh, the lives of children uh, impacted in ways that are going to be impactful uh, for our social and economic success for generations to come. UNICEF has made this very clear a few years ago. Uh, their Canada report on the comparison of children in the world's richest countries uh, was called Stuck in the Middle. And it talked about Canada ranking 17th among 29 richest countries in the world. So, you know, closer to Romania than to the Netherlands or to the Scandinavian countries that are typically at the top of the leaderboard across all these measures of, of child's rights implementation. And if you look at UNICEF's reports over time, they actually they show a broadening gap uh, between how Canadian children fare and how um, the rest of the world uh, fares. So we, uh, we are following further and further behind 
uh, our peers and children in the richest countries in the world, not because the situation of Canadian children is getting worse. We're actually making improvements. We're just not making the kinds of improvements, and we're not making enough improvements to keep up with the rest of the pack. And, and that is really going to harm our competitive advantage economically over time. And, and we need to correct this rapidly. Um, if you look at some of the things that are holding us back, look at the global initiative to end corporal punishment of all children. You have in yellow here all the countries in the world that have prohibited corporal punishment in all settings. In Canada, corporal punishment of children is prohibited in schools and in daycares and has been for many years. Uh, but we still have that Section 43 defense under the Criminal Code of Canada that says that it's, it's okay to spank your child at home between the ages of 2 and 12 if you don't use uh, any bats or uh, belts or cause any bruising, and if it's only applied as a corrective. So the Supreme Court of Canada came up with this wonky uh, decision in 2004 that tries to justify what constitutes reasonable force. And the courts across the land have just had a heyday, you know, trying to apply and interpret that case. Um, and it's not going very well. And we still have the social norm of spanking children as an accepted uh, parenting strategy in, in Canada. And so we're socializing children to violence. That has to stop. Um, if you look at the ratification of signatures of the Third Optional Protocol, a lot of those countries in blue are the same countries who are the countries in yellow. We know who the child's rights rendering countries are. How come Canada isn't part of that map? Look at all the list of countries that have a national commissioner for children. You know, we would like to see Canada in that list, but it's not, right? So these are all things that are, you know, done the world over that are good child's rights practice that Canada should be doing. And if we don't, um, we're going to continue to see uh, these poor comparisons. So, and it's not just uh, that Canada doesn't compare well and Canadian children don't compare well with the rest of the world. Uh, we don't. Um, we don't actually have equal access to justice for children in Canada. Look at the rates of youth in custody. And now the, uh, it's difficult to compare the blue and the orange because the, the blue is a rate and the orange is a number of children in closed custody. Blue is the rate of you know youth, one per 10,000 uh, in, uh, in, in custody in general uh, by province. And orange is the rate of children in secure custody. The kids, they're actually in a locked facility. Um, but if you can see, like, it's all over the map. You know, look at Manitoba. You know, Manitoba has, uh, has a rate uh, of custody that is way out of proportion uh, to its population compared to, you know, the rest of the country. Uh, and even the numbers, the sheer numbers, Ontario, which is like, you know, nine, eight, nine times the size of Manitoba, Manitoba has almost a third as many kids in custody as, uh, as Ontario. If you look at um, the number of kids in care, it's the same thing. You know, Manitoba and Quebec are neck and neck. But again, Quebec is, you know, six, five or six times the population of Manitoba. And you have 11,000 children in care in Quebec uh, and about the same number in, uh, in Manitoba. 90% of these kids in care in Manitoba are First Nation. So we actually have more children, more First Nations children in formal systems of care than at the height of the 60s scoop. And we're in the middle of a process of truth and reconciliation. How can we turn back the clock on that? Um, you know, look at this chart that talks about the disadvantage that Indigenous children compare have, you know, in comparison to their peers in terms of the poverty rates uh, for the population in general. Very concerning. You know, we were trying to get to zero poverty for children. That was a goal back in the 80s. Uh, we missed that goal. Uh, 
it, it's it's been stocked at 16, you know, or 17 percent uh, poverty rate, but it's closer to 40 percent in indigenous communities. Look at the reported violent incidents to youth, you know, double the rate of violence to indigenous children as to their Canadian pairs, five or six times the rate of youth incarceration. Uh, and this is something the Committee on the Rights of the Child has said to Canada, you've got to do something about the, the rate at which African Canadians and Indigenous Canadians are being put to jail. And we have these Bladu principles, but is it making an impact? Um, so if we don't have good data, we can't be measuring these things. We still have these very prevalent attitudes. You know, this is a poster of a movie from the 50s, Riot in Juvenile Prisons. You know, here's another one, Teenage Crime Wave. It still talks about, you know, uh, what people are thinking, what's happening to our young people. They disrespect their elders. They disobey their parents. They ignore the law. They riot in the streets and play with wild notions. Their morals are decaying. What's to become of them? You know, that's still a kind of prevalent attitude in Canadian society today. There's a, uh, a researcher uh, who's completed a master's of law thesis uh, in the Netherlands recently in Fredericton. And, and she's looking at uh, public and judicial attitudes to sentencing in, uh, in Holland uh, versus New Brunswick. And, um, you know, we're still in these, you know, dark ages of the Juvenile Delinquents Act. This is actually a quote from Plato. Uh, so it's an old, <laughs> you know, it's an old attitude, intergenerational attitude that uh, elders have about youth. A lot has got to change. I just wanted to wrap up with a few slides that talk about what it is that we can do as professionals to be part of this culture change, to understand children's rights seriously, and to uh, and, and, and to see the needle move in the direction that we'd like to see it move in so that Canada can catch up with the rest of the developed world and put our children first. So pediatricians have a huge role in this. Um, it's been wonderful uh, uh, to have the opportunity. Uh, last month, I was down at the IWK and uh, was invited to speak to pediatricians in one of the Grand Round lectures. And uh, uh, I just can't believe that we don't have a better, more sustained dialogue with this is the Children's Hospital for the Maritimes. We have this huge pediatric capacity of experts that are doing clinics and they're coming to New Brunswick and our, and our kids are going down to Halifax to receive care. Um, but they don't know that we have a child and youth advocate in New Brunswick. And uh, Newfoundland, uh, uh, or Prince Edward Island, is establishing one as well. And they also send their kids to the IWK. But the IWK team, um, they don't have that experience because in Nova Scotia, they just have an ombudsman with one or two people on staff who deals with child, youth, and seniors' issues. And so, uh, so we need to be working better. We need to be, you know, referring uh, patients to each other. We need to, uh, we need pediatricians at the IWK to understand what it is that we're doing in New Brunswick with, with integrated service delivery. Okay? And we'd like to see more pediatricians in New Brunswick explore new models for patient care, like social pediatrics and community. Social pediatrics and community in Quebec is huge, and it's, it's wonderful to see pediatricians leading the charge and making the case for children's rights enforcement. Um, through these social pediatrics hubs, pediatricians are stepping out of their clinical uh, role model and they're teaming up with lawyers and with social workers um, so that they can provide wraparound care for their patients. Uh, Dr. Gilles Julien is the innovator and leader of this transformation in Quebec. There are over uh, 30, uh, moving on 40, social ped centers throughout the province. We now have one in Memramcook. Uh, and our next webinar series, Dr. Sarah Gander from St. John is going to talk about how she's reinventing her practice, how St. John is, is moving towards a social pediatrics model. Um, and all, all the Quebec network for social peds is infused and informed by child's rights-based approaches. Um, and I've never seen anything like it. I've been working at this. This is the mission of Champions for Children 
to make children's rights uh, a lived experience for New Brunswick children so that professionals like the people on this webinar, uh, as social workers, as lawyers, as nurses, as teachers, that we start to raise our game about what do we know about children's rights and how do we act towards children as duty holders and how do we inform children of their rights. And that transformation is happening in Quebec and it's happening because of pediatricians. Pediatricians are leading the way. Um, social workers are also leading the way in that revolution in Quebec because for every hour of pediatric care in a social peds clinic, you have four hours of social work support. That's the model, basically, how social peds works. And those social peds, they're supporting children in their clinics by um, establishing child and youth rights teams. So the kids come to the clinic, you know, not just for services, they come because it's a great place to hang out, because they have music classes, because uh, they can, you know, learn new recipes, uh, because they have all kinds of activities going on and because they are given agency. People are listening to them and they are learning about their rights and they're making a difference in their community as young people. So they're, they're moving from vulnerability to resiliency. That's what social work can do when it's done well. That's what social workers have as you know their greatest gift uh, uh, in a multidisciplinary listening team is their ability to put best interest principles forward and to put youth voice forward because social workers are the people who can listen to children and, and who can work with families so that parents are listening to children and so that children develop uh, to their full potential. So, so this, is, uh, this is the transformation that we'd like to see in New Brunswick. If you're a social worker, then you are that specialist in child voice. You are that specialist in best interest principles. Uh, you need to know about uh, Article 18. You need to know about all those family environment rights of children, Articles 5 through 8, 18 to 20, 25 to 27, and also their protection rights uh, under Articles 30 to 36, right? Uh, the child's right to be protected from uh, uh, drug endangerment, their uh, protection from economic exploitation, their protection from sexual exploitation, their protection from any other form of exploitation, um, their right to rehabilitation if they've been involved in armed conflict or were child soldiers. All of those are rights that social workers uh, can support. Uh, the key is to really invest in those relational supports. Teachers also have a huge role in uh, emulating child's rights principles and translating knowledge of children's rights to children themselves. So what can you do as a teacher uh, to make your classroom a rights-respecting classroom, to make your school a rights-respecting school? Go and Google UNICEF's rights-respecting schools programs. We have three accredited rights-respecting schools in New Brunswick. We'd like to see 300, you know, uh, but teachers can really lead the way in this transformation. Um, and and we, we invest a lot in our curriculum in, uh, in human rights education, but why are we teaching children about human rights without talking to them about children's rights? We should start with children's rights. Uh, we should do everything we can to nurture children's agency in the governance of their school, to really share power with children in schools, because it's their school and uh, in a rights-respecting school, that's what happens. You know, Park Street Elementary is a great example of that here in Fredericton. So, and what do we do as, to, as teachers to look beyond um, their academic achievement and look to the needs of the whole child? We're all working um, as, uh, as part of a team around children. Police officers are part of that team. There's all kinds of ways in which uh, Police can be doing that better. The YCJA invites police uh, to only use prosecution as a last resort with children. Um, and we've seen great, great success with the rollout of youth justice committees and uh, alternative measures and uh, extrajudicial sanctions programs in New Brunswick. We'd like to go beyond extrajudicial sanctions and really get down to the level of extrajudicial measures. Uh, we're very concerned as an office with the continued
prosecution of the most vulnerable youth who are really engaging in disorderly conduct, not because of criminogenic profile, but because of a diagnosis, a mental health diagnosis, an addictions problem, or an FASD uh, learning disability. Uh, we need to be giving these children the respect and the interventions that they need and not to be criminalizing their conduct. Nurses can be a part of this, of course, as well. Uh, it's fantastic to see uh, the work that, uh, that, uh, pe that public health nurses are doing in this field, uh, but they shouldn't be alone in this. They should be part of integrated service delivery. We need to be working uh, between public health and education and child protection the way we're doing for older kids in school uh, when they run into problems. We can be doing that in a social pediatric environment from day one, uh, even before children are born. You know, I looked all through the internet uh, for a nice picture of a lawyer with a child. I mean, look at all these child-friendly pictures of all these other professionals dealing with kids, and I couldn't find a single picture of that kind <laughs> for lawyers. So lawyers, the challenge is out there. You know, you've got to you've got to really reinvent yourself. You know, and and that's the real problem is that children don't have deep pockets and they don't make great clients. And we, as lawyers, we don't have enough interface uh, with children. Um, but you know, we need to be part of this revolution, this rights revolution for children, and uh, we need to be the ones that know all about children's rights who have to be defending them at every turn pushing back, um, you know, opportunities for prosecution when diversion is uh, the better approach, uh, insisting that we have child-friendly justice for child protection processes and, and that we not be um, traumatizing children further through adversarial processes uh, that, you know, that just rip their families apart. Um, so, yeah, lawyers, lawyers have a lot to do. Uh, there's a lot of good work that the CBA has done. Uh, we can we can really make the difference in uh, bringing child's rights analysis into the courts every day by using the CBA child's rights toolkit, by referencing the rights under the convention uh, for children uh, in cases uh, that have to be determined by the courts. Um, and, and so there's a lot of work that we can all do. Uh, that's really the end of the slides. And I know we're right at the end, but if there are questions, I'd you know, be happy to take a few. Yeah. All right, yeah, so we did get a lot of questions. Um, sorry we're not going to be able to get too many of them today. But we had some people asking, um, how would a separate and distinct child protection act align with current integrated service delivery approach in New Brunswick? Well, it's a great question. I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, the advocate, uh, I was in a meeting with Mr. Basse and uh, the Minister and Deputy Minister of Social Development. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a key commitment of, uh, of the government to move forward with that recommendation from the SAVERY report. And, and we're going to be working very closely with them to make sure that uh, we can update our child protection legislation without losing any of the benefits. In fact, so this is an opportunity, actually, to really uh, to, to bring integrated service delivery, to bring family group conferencing, to bring all these great innovative practices that have kind of developed on the sides of the legislation within uh, the legislative framework. Uh, so I, I'm excited uh, for that task and the work ahead. We are going to be bringing forward our own recommendations to government. We know that government wants to proceed with this as quickly as possible, uh, and we're going to be working uh, with them as closely as we can uh, so that some of these recommendations can stick. Okay, and one other question. Um, what do you think is the best way to really engage children while avoiding tokenism? And what's the, ba the best way to create real valuable consultation with children that we work with? Uh, excellent question. Um, you know, we, everyone is, uh, is, is new at this. Uh, the, the, the greatest cultural shift, I think, that has to happen uh, is around taking children seriously and, and respecting the fact that they are in a process of maturation and developing capacities. Um, but the challenge always is to keep 
a step ahead of that developing capacity. So that at every stage of development of a child's life, that the adult ally and the caring parent and, and, and the coach and the community worker are always nurturing agency, always nurturing uh, you know, that and supporting uh, that voice and capacity. So it's, um, but it's so counter culture. It's so much like not how we were raised and, and not what we've been doing, right? Um, so it's, it, it's a huge revolution. Right? And, and that's really what children's equality, the, the heart of children's equality is. And, and of course, like children are vulnerable and they have, uh, and we have to act always in their best interest. And so there, there are times when parents and, and others in, uh, in a parent's role, you know, have to make decisions for children and, and that can be conflictual, but it doesn't have to be conflictual. And so I think, you know, um, there's, it, it's a it's a really great question. It's a it's it's work that um, the amongst the advocates community, the Ontario Child and Youth Advocate, which has just been disbanded by the Ford government, did better than anyone else. They were really the leaders in Canada in terms of listening intensely to children and supporting and amplifying children's voice and supporting youth agency. So you want to know how to do it well? Look at everything that Erwin Elman has been doing for the last 10 years. And, you know, let's have more of that. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Christian, for your presentation. I know I learned so much and we got a lot of comments really thanking you for, the, uh, for all the information you shared and also for the national approach that you took. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It is, uh, like I said, it's a... Uh, it's really great to see Champions for Children uh, organizing these webinars with the NBSW. Uh, I'm, I'm glad there were all these questions. I'm sorry, I was, you know, I didn't see your questions coming in, so I'm thinking, okay, not too many people are out there. It's a snow day. <laughs> Chris, you're talking to yourself. And so I apologize for not leaving room for that the dialogue session at the end. Um, there is going to be uh, a repeat of this session en français next mm -hmm. week. So that's a note to self to leave more time for questions. And uh, if, if you want to put your question in French, we can have the conversation then. Otherwise, please be in touch with the advocate's office because that's another reason why I'm here today and doing this is so that we can, uh, we can engage community on these issues and that we can dialogue and, and work through the issues together. So I'd be glad to have your questions by email uh, or a phone call. That's perfect. Uh, like Christian just said, there's going to be a French session next Wednesday of uh, this webinar. And also following that, Dr. Sarah Gander will be um, presenting a webinar titled Social Pediatrics in New Brunswick. And that will take place on March 11th at 12 p.m. So be sure to look out for more details on that coming in the near future. Again, the recording for today's webinar will be uploaded to CASW's website tomorrow. And for those who require confirmation of attendance is available now by clicking the yellow icon at the bottom right of your window. So with that being said, another sincere thank you to you, Christian, for coming in today. We really Great. appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and thank you to the audience for your attention and your questions. So I'll see you all next time, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. That's really good. I, I, I saw you with all those questions. I think, oh, shoot. Yeah, I know. There's lots of engagement. Yeah.